So, just want to uh, run through the uh, folk who are up here tonight. We've got, uh, obviously, Roger, Roger Sutton, who will be talking around the decision process. Dr. Jan Kopek, who will be able to address the geotechnical information, and most of you have met these guys already, obviously. Uh, I'll be talking briefly about the Section 124 notices, what they mean, and then there's uh, a support and assistance uh, package that Roger's going to take us through just to make sure that everybody knows what's out there, and then we'll move through the, um, the actual Q&A part of the session. So again, Sarah are here, Christchurch City Council is here, EQC, insurers, the Stronger Christchurch Infrastructure Rebuild Team, the SETAS people, the temporary accommodation people, the uh, earthquake support coordinators, and we also want to thank the uh, Salvation Army, who are here with us tonight providing a cup of tea and some uh, biscuits to keep you going. So uh, I'll hand over to Roger and get you to take us through the process, Roger, leading up to the decisions. Um, uh, thanks, Bob. It was really nice to be here tonight, um, but I wanted to start off by um, first of all, just apologising. Most of you are here are white zone people. Do you want to give us a hand? How many red people are here? Greens. So you're mainly white. So I mean, well, you all, you all, with whatever colour you are, you all deserve an apology because it's taken an awful long time to get decisions to you. And for the people who are white, it's um, it's excruciating for you, and I really do apologise for that. Um, we have worked hard to try and get decisions out as quickly as we can, and we've let you down, um, and I apologise. Um, we're trying to get the, your decisions to you as quickly as we're able to, and we've given a commitment to get those decisions by, out by the 17th of August. Um, I also wanted to apologise for um, the debacles on Friday in terms of um, the website. Um, people had a lot of trouble getting information. People have approached me tonight saying they gave us on two or three occasions the correct temporary address they'd given us to get letters to them, and those letters still haven't turned up and so on. Um, I'm sorry, our systems are not fantastic. Um, people at the back um, from some of our team um, are able to take your details, and we'll be able to put them into, your, into our system if we haven't actually got your correct temporary details and so on. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say at the outset as well was that there is going to be an appeals process. So for people who are, aren't a colour they like at the moment, there will be an appeals process. I guess there's not going to be an appeals process to get these out of white because we haven't you know, made, made a designing decision. But there will be one, there will be one that's coming. Um, what the, how that process works, we haven't worked through. Um, we, we've, um, we've got one for the flatland. I think it'll be very similar to the one we've got on the flatland, I would expect. So the context is this has been you know, decisions made by the government. Um, working with our friends at the council based on the geotech data, um, but also based on um, the modelling that's done, but also some input from, well, it's not some, lots of input from the geotech engineers. But it's been very much the zoning, but has been much um, about that geotech information. It's taken a long time, much longer than, it, than many people would have liked, um, but it's, it's been difficult. The decisions um, aren't pleasing everybody. Um, certainly the decision for white isn't pleasing people, but I guess I'd also say that there are people here tonight who are green who want to be red, and there are red people here who want to be green as well. So on the flat land, we've, we, you know, there are similar issues as well. You know, I've spoken to a number of the white people um, over the last uh, four or five days um, and explained that and a lot of those white people I've spoken to are white people who have wanted to have been green, and I think it was going to, always going to be very hard to turn you, if you like, a pure green on Friday. And what I mean by a pure green is, you know, I know Ralph was one of those people. You know, Ralph, you're now green. You can, you know, no more Section 124. It's safe to be back in your house without any protection because the level of life risk was identified was, is not a level of life risk which, if you like, the government was happy with. So if you weren't going to go remain white, if we were going to say you're getting protection, that protection was going to take a period of time. So even if you'd gone a shade of green, if you like, it wouldn't have meant you would have been able to go back into your house right away. It would have been until that protection had been built. 
And I guess the other alternative would have been if, he had, if he'd made a, a final decision, it would have been to go red. And I think for a lot of people who are in your White Houses, you wouldn't want to have gone red. The numbers, so, you know, there were about 1,550 that were, that we, re, that we, that are, you know, residential occupied properties. 1,100 went green, 285 went red. Um, the majority of those were cliff collapsed, 94 were rock roll, 166 are still white, eight properties in Lucas Lane. Are the Lucas Lane people here at all? Hello, Lucas Lane. So the Lucas Lane, um, we've said that's not going to be by the by the, um, that 17th of August. It's going to be a bit longer. We've had someone come and see you and talk to you about that. The technical um, zoning, the, all the zoning reports, we'll be putting those out um, once all the decisions are made. So three main issues: um, cliff collapse. Is anyone here impacted by cliff collapse? Really, very few. Okay, so maybe yeah, and we're talking tonight. We'll spend very little time on the cliff collapse stuff. Um, landslip. There's not many people involved in landslip. Um, it's mainly rock roll. Um, and there'll be some people here who are a combination of um, of all three, I guess. But um, the way the zoning decision went, these big GNS models have been run. And the inputs that go into this big GNS model are all the fundamentally all the observations that have been made by engineers. And those observations about where boulders are, how big they are, how easy how easy will be them for displace, the slope, the nature of the slope, and all those sorts of things. And if that model says your house has got more than one in a thousand, you've got more than one in a thousand chance of you being killed in your house, then you went red. Over time, the seismic risk is decreasing, and that means that if you've got one in a thousand chance now of dying in your house, in three or four years' time, it will have dropped to being about one in 2,000, and then maybe in 15, 20 years' time, it may have dropped to something like one in seven or 8,000. It will have dropped, but it won't have dropped by a whole order of magnitude. If it's one in a thousand now, in 15, 20 years' time, it's going to be maybe one in eight, one in 9,000, maybe getting close to that one in 10,000. But at the one in a thousand, you went red. We then said if you were, if you were better than one in 5,000, you went green. And it wasn't actually one in 5,000 calculation exactly. It was actually running the model based on the 2016 seismicity at one in 10,000, which equates to one in 5,000 now. Does that make sense? Can I just call it one in 5,000 now? Otherwise, and we, we, can, we can talk about that afterwards. If you're in between the one in a thousand and the one in five thousand, we called you white. So the reason for that is um, we haven't we haven't yet um, persuaded everybody, persuaded ourselves that mitigation is going to work, and we think for most of those properties, if we're going to let people back in in the, in the immediate term, some mitigation is going to be is going to be necessary. There's also the issue of people who are just outside that one in 5,000, you know, one in 4,998, if you're able to calculate the model that exactly. You know, well, we're going to call you red, you know, even though you are quite soon going to be turning green, so to speak. And we didn't think that made a whole lot of sense. So we would kind of work out how do, we, how do we handle those sorts of cases. I think it's also just fair to say that but different people have different levels of... Um, Risk tolerance as well. Um, some people have higher risk tolerances, some people have lower risk tolerances. My own life risk, um, I'm a 47-year-old male, so the chances of me dying in any year from a heart attack, cancer, um, I don't know, falling off my bike is about 1 in 300. Um, my 10-year-old son has a chance of about 1 in 10,000 and my 80-year-old dad has a chance of about, um, about 1 in 10. So your life risk varies a lot you know, over your lifetime from you know, that, that, if you like, that best point of 1 in 10,000 for my 10-year-old down to you know, as the older you get, obviously the, the higher your chances get. So I think I've talked about this. Um, the 1 in 10,000 is that, that overall li risk, um, acceptable life risk level that if you go read... Don't talk to the experts. If you talk to what people think is generally acceptable internationally, that's the sort of level of life risk we get to. 
Um, I've talked a bit about this, so it's the people in the middle, it's between one in a thousand, one in five thousand. You're not quite green. Um, so in these next seven and a half weeks, the further thing we're going to do, further life risk modelling to try and understand this model a bit further, try and get some more, if you like, some more preciseness of people in the middle, where they, where they really are. We want to look at more options and give those to ministers and the council, and then cabinet will have, um, well, cabinet will, will then make that decision. In terms of mitigation, um, a lot of people are asking about mitigation. Um, we don't have all the answers around that. And for some people I know, mitigation they'd be really happy with. They'd be really happy living under a fence or a bund. Um, not everybody is. Um, some people would feel safe, others wouldn't. And Jan's going to talk a bit about that. Um, we have done quite a lot of work on fences and so on. And these fences, these big strong fences, they're very, very strong, wonderful things. But these fences, aren't tend to, they haven't tended to be used out of places in the world to stop rocks coming down because of earthquakes. And what happens when an earthquake happens is you tend to get more than one boulder coming off a slope at once, you know, more than one comes down. In a weather event, like it rains, and I guess more rain than we've got tonight, the boulders tend to come down one at a time, so it's easier to, to, to design the fence because you only have to stop one boulder at a time, even if it's a pretty bloody big boulder. So it's easier to design it. The problem with the earthquake is that's the thing the engineers hesitate a bit about, is the fact you've got potentially lots of boulders coming down at once, and it's hard knowing exactly how many are going to come down in an event, which is why the engineers hesitate. I guess as one of the people in the middle of this decision, who's giving advice to ministers and, and member people in the council and so on, is I think the engineers in general who are less, they're not, they haven't written them off, but they're less positive about fences than they were um, three or four months ago. And I guess I stood in this room and talked to a lot of you about the fact I was really enthusiastic about fences. I'm, I, I still haven't given up on fences, but I'm less positive than I was. And you can criticise me for that, but I guess at least I fronted up and told you what was going on in my mind at the time. And if I, yeah. Um... I guess the other thing about things like some buns, people have talked about buns that don't actually stop the rocks, they deflect them. You get into issues that, you know, you can end up putting rocks into someone else's house or someone else's road or those sort of things. So they, they aren't particularly easy. Um, one of the things people asked me tonight was if I went white, if I'm white, if, I'm, if I've gone green, but there's people above me who have gone white, did you consider in making me green the fact that house might not be there in a year's time or two years' time if it went red? Is that a question people understand? So the model assumes bare land. The model doesn't actually assume the house above you is, is there. So the model actually assumes if you're green, it assumes the house above you um, isn't there in terms of the level of right, life, risk, life risk you've done. One of the other questions that came up last night was, um, in general, well not in general, where, the, where this life risk line, this 1 in 5,000 line has gone through part of your house, on your section. So if that's if that's your if that's your hunk of that's your that's your half acre, for some of you have got half an acre, and your house is in the middle here, and that life risk line, that five thousand line went through part of your house, we turned you red. And once again we turned you white if your one in five thousand line went through part of your house. The question was if you'd gone red and some people wanted to stay, can I move my can I can I contest that by moving my house down and moving away from where that life risk line was? And that's a very good question. We don't have an answer for you yet because that's, that's just a question we haven't yet had a chance to, to work through. But it's a question which is worthy of us working through. Um, I was now going to hand over to Jan, and Jan will go through the, the geotech stuff, and we're going to try and keep the questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roger. <clears throat> right. Good evening. I see many familiar faces over here because it's not the first time I'm actually fronting up to you. So, again, my apologies that most of you are right now in the white zone, but we actually weren't able to do the decisions on time as we initially actually set out to do. But what I prepared the presentation for with the intent to split it essentially in three bits um, landslides, um, cliff collapse, and rockfall. Now, since most of you actually are here for um, rockfall, I'm just going to skip very quickly through the 
other technical information. So just for a bit background information, the majority of the slides on the Port Hills are actually this type of situations where we have slope failures or where um, liquefaction activates the tool and we actually get um, large failures. The notable exceptions are those slides or slips associated with cliff collapse, which generally are the ones in Peacock's Gallop or Red Cliffs or Whitewash Head, and Lucas Lane in the back, because the situation over there is markedly different. If you're looking at cliff collapse again, um, for general understanding, um, you can see indicated over here greenhouses and red houses. And if you're starting from the top, you can see obviously that the house is half missing. It's fairly obvious why we turn it red. Um, but then behind it, you can see the next row of houses generally. Um, the cracks actually extend through the soil, through the rocks, and actually make the cliff much more susceptible for future failure. We also calculated what the likely retreat is going to be per repeat event. So if you have another repeat of June or February, how much actually if cliff we lose. Now probably for background information for those of you um, and some now who didn't appreciate this, February caused um, damage and June caused four times the amount of damage on the Port Hills in this particular area. So if you're looking about the material that had fallen off on the cliffs, the rocks that have fallen down, generally speaking, the um, slopes, especially on the rocks, um, sorry, on the cliffs, were weakened, okay? And if you drive past Peacock's Gallop, you know that after February, the talus slope was relatively small and then it actually extended much further forward. Now, if you look down towards this, you can see where the debris slope comes and a small material falls down, it actually started to sort of build up like a ski jump and actually dramatically changes the behavior of the debris apron. Now, again, very quickly going through this. So on the cliffs, it's not just the cracking, as indicated in yellow. There's actually these large blue blobs, which actually as the slope shakes and actually cracks the land and land has moved significantly, significantly weakened. And this is just the behavior of the large slopes, but we also have here the behavior of the small slopes. So if you go to the other end of Nayland Street, you will see there was a small cliff that actually has failed. So if you actually consider um, that as a factual information, and this is actually the zoning information, then the little red blobs are actually the smaller cliffs which have a life safety hazard as well. So that's Peacock's Gallop, since you're here for Rockfall. Um, I'm gonna skip through it. This is the cliff just about 50 meters over here, and that's Richmond Hill. And as I mentioned, this cliff did not fail in February, but it failed fairly catastrophically in June. And you can see the talus extent over here is up to this point. And if you compare it with um, Clifton, we expect the talus to expect, uh, the extent the next time, should it fail, to extend where the current container row is. And again, that's the reason for the zoning decision over here. Very quickly, that is the area around Red Cliffs. And again, similarly, where actually the zoning decisions went to. And lastly, probably more topical over here, that's the area towards that end, which is Whitewash Head. Uh, we had the largest amount of debris coming off this cliff, which is over 100 meters tall. And again, that is reflected in the zoning decisions. Just probably noting over here, some of you may have noticed these little blue dotted lines on there. Um, these lines denote where we expect per event the cliff to retreat to. So we're expecting to lose an average 15 meters of essentially call it an onion skin of the cliff in another repeat event. So that's what GNS have indicated in the models. However, most of you are here for this situation. Now let me actually walk you through this um, scenario over here. Now, we have here volcanic bluffs that are actually cropping out and the first thing what is different over here, we have not just one rockfall source, but numerous bluffs on top of each other. So if you're looking above Hebden Avenue or Wakefield Avenue, you can see various outcrops one after another. 
And then we have individual rocks that have probably in previous events have fallen and are sitting on the um, slope itself. Now, if you actually go down the slope, what we realize is that the majority of the material is lying closer up where the red house is. So as the material falls down, a lot of the um, smaller stuff actually is arrested closest to the source. So if you're standing essentially where the red house is, and you would be um, sitting there during the earthquake, you will see many, many more rocks will passing you than, for example, down where the greenhouse is. Okay? So the number of rocks close to the source is highest, and that to some degree drives the risk, which I'll explain in the next slide. However, as the boulders um, bounce down, um, you can actually see first they bounce, and they fly, and then they're actually starting to roll down the slope. And that pretty much depends on the uh, geology and the surface condition where the rock's bouncing on, but it also depends on the um, slope conditions, whether there is a forest, whether there is actually a residential subdivision, or whether there are small coastal cliffs where it can go and uh, go up to speed again. Key statistics over here, the average boulder on the Port Hills is about one cubic meter, 0.7 of the cubic meter to one cubic meter, depending where you are, and that translates to about two and a half to three tons of material. So that's the average Range Rover SUV. And the um, trajectories that were taken were back calculated and compared to actually eyewitness accounts, and we calculate that most of the boulders were skipping at uh, the speed of between 70 and 90 kilometers per hour. In a lot of instances, we couldn't actually match the first set of bounce marks because we just couldn't figure out how they actually were driven out of the slope. The first time we actually realized that when we started to put into the model an initial velocity of about one meter second sideways and one and a half meters per second upwards. That was the only way we could actually match the first set of bounce marks because we could match where the boulder was lying, which way it was hopping uphill, and where it actually sat in its pocket. So we're talking about very large seismic accelerations that have dislodged these boulders. And I mentioned this on several previous iterations, that this is different to the normal rockfall that is triggered either by weathering, which is actually the deterioration of the rock mass with time, or it will be also different with um, the ma uh, major rainstorm event or the major um, snowfall events, which we have generally in the Rocky Mountains or in the um, European Alps. So these are the natural processes. Now, you can see there's a lot of boulders indicated over here. Just to give you some examples, um, the boulders that were locked in the Hebert and Avenue side were about 500 of them. And on Wakefield Avenue, we have about 350 boulders in February, and we had the same amount about in June. That was per event. So if you calculate right now that we have, say, a 500 meter length, we have 500 meters uh, of boulders. On average, there's actually one boulder coming down per meter. And that's what also Roger mentioned, is the effectiveness of fences. Fences are generally designed per panels, which the panel is 10 meter wide to take an impact from one or two design boulders, the large washing machine size boulders. The very moment you have multiple boulders coming, the fence starts to fail. And if you have, like over here, up to 10 boulders per panel, then it could very well be that after the fifth impact, the panel is actually down, and you just release the rest of them down. All the testing that's being undertaken in Europe, they chuck one boulder down, then remove it, and then chuck an axe one down there. Again, a situation which is not replicable over here because you will not have the um, helping army sitting there and removing them quickly before the next one uh, tanks into it. So that's one of these things which we actually have been given by our geotechnical experts. But looking more at the diagram over here, if you look, there are some greenhouses further down the slope, but if you look and the uh, um, picture down on the left hand side next to the um, greenhouse, there are some boulders lying in there. So if you have a greenhouse, it doesn't mean that it wasn't impacted. But what it means is that the chance of a triggering event like February and June is reducing, reducing with time. 
Okay? That's one of the key information. So the risk is based on the changes of seismicity because seismicity is what triggers this massive amount of rocks coming down there. Probably uh, some background information. We had um, the GNS a look to um, the last 150 years of Canterbury on rock falls in the Banks Peninsula and the Port Hills. And on average, we have about 20 events in the Port Hills related to rock fall or natural hazards as a matter of background. So there was always a background of about 20 events per year. And that's looking at old newspaper clippings, looking at the Museum of Canterbury records, looking what now is EQC records, previously um, city records, talking with people who actually worked in the infrastructure. So certainly rockfall has occurred. The difference was it was one boulder coming out of the hillside after a major rain event. It was not 500 of them. Now, if I'm actually describing to you, first of all, the seismicity, and I'm gonna spend one or two minutes on here. Now, if you're talking about life safety risk, what we're actually talking about is a term annual individual fatality risk, okay? And it's a term coined by experts in risk, and I have to admit I am not one expert in risk, I'm an expert in ground engineering, but I've been working alongside experts for risk for the pretty majority of my career. Um, what we're looking at about how likely an individual is to likely to die in an activity. Now, if you look at New Zealand roading death, so the chance of actually dying as a roading accident, there are 400 people on average killed on New Zealand roads per annum. And there are 4 million people living in New Zealand. So 400 divided by 4 million is about 1 in 10,000. So if you participate in roading, either as a passenger or as an active driver, your chance to die per annum is one in 10,000, okay? Now, what does this number mean, actually? The number means that New Zealand Transport Agency spends a fair amount of their budget to actually keep the number that low. They do awareness campaigns, they do a lot of safety on the roads, they have a very strict design standards, and that's the reason the number is that low. If you compare it to some developing country, the number of um, annual individual life safety risk from traffic accidents can be as low as one in a hundred, depending where you are, okay? Now, there are other activities you should consider. So if you're going for a motorbike ride, you like, uh, a chance to die is about one in a thousand. So I'm trying to put the numbers out here just to compare what we, the numbers we're talking about. If you're looking at mountain climbing, and then your chance to die is about one in 100. If you're a crop duster pilot, and if you are a crop duster pilot, I apologize, but if you are a crop duster pilot, your chance is about one in 50. And it becomes then very, very quickly because there are 50 pilots about in New Zealand, and about one of them bites the dust every year. Okay? So these are roughly the numbers. There are differences that it, uh, if you do and go in the mountains, or if you actually engage in activities that have a higher risk, you generally gain benefit from this one. What we have been advised by international experts is that the societal risk to um, people dying in any given activity is about one in 10,000, or should be about one in 10,000. Some other countries, like um, Holland, for example, have the mark set up at about one in 100,000, and there are certain activities where um, the life safety risk is even higher. Now, going to this plot over here, what you actually see on this side over here is the annual individual fatality risk. And the first thing you realize is it actually is logarithmic, so it jumps by orders of magnitude, okay? Then we have on this side over here, we have actually the time. So at the moment, it's dated to the 1st of January 2012. So we are already past the worst because we had more than nine months of seismic decay since February, and we had more than six months at that stage, seismic decay from June. Now, what do these different colors mean? First of all, this is closest to the cliff. That's about an intermediate distance and is down at the bottom. Now, I'll explain 
this on this diagram over here. So we have a hill. We have somewhere between the top and roughly this point over here, actually the um, bluffs, the rockfall source. And it, in this particular instance, whether it is just a block or a cliff or a whole series of cliff cliff, what we assume that it is a source and then from the bottom of the source, we're projecting an angle of 21 degrees down into the valley and we have taken the, where the line intersects the ground, we have mapped that no boulder went past this point. So this is the line of negligible risk line. So if you run essentially the, to this side of the line, Technically speaking, there should be no boulder coming down during a major seismic event. So either June or February or something bigger, because mechanically they don't go any further. So everything stops at this line. The closer you go up towards the source, the steeper the angle. So if you're looking over here, at 23 degrees, which is a green line, you have a life safety risk exposure, simply because you are right now in a zone where rocks will run past you. If you go steeper, higher up the hill, you can see the curve actually goes higher up, so your life safety risk increases. And if you go very close to the life safety uh, source, so in an area roughly over here, you can see straight away the life safety risk is disproportionately higher than actually on the green line. This is the first information. So the closer you are to the rock source, the higher you are exposed from rock fall, or the higher the chance of you becoming injured or dying. Okay? The second information over here is that the line decays. So it starts relatively high and then very quickly, even over the period of say five years, it decreases dramatically. And remember this was a logarithmic scale, so um, if you're looking at the green line over here, it could be somewhere in a one in a thousand at the beginning of the year, and then about five years later, it reduces dramatically, okay? So this is just an indication, and this one um, seismic model is driven by the uh, um, National Seismic Hazard Model, which again GNS provides. And this is the same model which is used for building design. So it's no different to this model. And that's one of the key input parameters into the risk model, which I'm going to show you in a minute. But if you cap up, the closer you to the, si uh, to the source, or to an area which could actually channel rock towards you, the higher life safety exposure. The second key information, the more time passes, the less likely you are to have the large event from occurring. Okay? So the repeat from a February event is right now much higher than it will be in five years time, and then in another five years time, it drops further down. And the large seismic events is what drives the mass flux of rocks coming down towards you. Now, coming to practical examples, and I'm going to explain before we get any further the colors, first of all. You will see they are, um, we omitted the current zoning decision, so left it transparent as an aerial photograph. But you will see two red colors in there. The brighter red is actually the red. Um, the cliff collapse was the cause. And if we looked at properties that have a combination of different risks, such as rockfall, small amount of land slippage, and possibly a cliff collapse nearby, then in order of um, appearance, it is going to be a cliff collapse has the highest life safety risk. It can happen very suddenly, and large portions of the property can be either inundated or disappear over the edge then is rockfall, and then is actually landsliding. So there are certain properties that uh, which you may say, look, that had rockfall, but there is to some degree cliff collapse involved as well. The maroon color is um, the area which uh, we have deemed has a life safety risk exposure less than 1,000 currently, which means that even in five years time or 10 years time, the life safety risk will not reached a target of one in 10,000. Now, 
If you look at numbers, then over the next five years, the life safety risk will about half. Okay? So if you're currently one in 5,000, which is the green zone definition, in five years' time, you reach the target of one in 10,000. If you are currently a one in 1,000, in five years' time, you will be only one in 2,000. Twice that. In another five years, you will be only one in 4,000. So one times two times two is four. So you never reach 10,000, okay? So that's the information. So actually, if you look at this map, you will see straight away where the areas are, where the risk exposure is much higher, and where risk exposure is much lower. But probably by way of example, let me show you some other information that we actually considered. So if I remove the zoning right now and put actually all the red dots as the boulders that were recorded. GNS risk zoning decisions were supplemented by the 3D rockfall study, which is this material over here. So what it shows over here is actually the number of transits. So if you have another repeat event, the model actually calculated where rocks will go to. Now this model is different to the model um, Roger uh, talked about. This model actually does consider uh, the houses in line, and it does consider other man-made objects such as roads, but it doesn't consider trees in this very instance. Now, if you look, for example, in this area over here, you can see there are some housing stock that actually will stop some roads, but the boulders penetrate in between them. On average, just to give you some idea, a New Zealand house, which is the standard brick on um, timber um, inside, has a capacity of about 50 kilojoule as energy ratings. Uh, 300 millimeter thick reinforced steel concrete wall has a capacity of about 500 kilojoule. Some of these paths, especially in the blue ones, we have energies of over several thousand kilojoules. The other thing is, and again, I apologize because you will not be able to read these numbers over here. We have areas, especially down here, and areas down in this area, and some areas are on Habitat Avenue, which actually act as uh, lensing areas. And lensing areas is a technical term, is the gully cell, which a lot of rocks will naturally actually trend to fall into and then run within them. So the darker the color, the more likely you are to actually be hit by a rock in there. But generally speaking, if you would do a similar analysis in European Alps, the most colors would be in the orange to light yellow, but nothing in the dark greens or blues. Now, if I look really on top of this, the zoning information, which is based on the risk maps, and as Roger indicated, the risk maps are based on a naked slope, and then remove the zoning information, as I said, and that's the current zoning information. Now, this is Sumner. Um, I have another example over here from Avoca Valley. Is here anybody from Avoca Valley? Excellent. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to go to the same exercise. And again, you can see the boulders over here, where they impacted. You can see the 3D model as it was run. Um, and again, you can see the distinct areas which actually trend and focus on materials, but equally so the areas which actually disperse. So these are the humps and these are the hollows. And the material, the model actually indicated that they will stop at some points. And again, that was one of the reasons why we actually assigned over here um, certain um, zoning decisions. Now, if you are green, then the annual individual life safety risk is much lower because, again, the driving source, the big earthquakes, becoming rarer and rarer. What we're going to do in the um, white areas, I'm going to be talking about in a, in a second. And again, that's the current zoning decision. I have here um, one more example. That's Bridal Path in Morgan's Valley. But you can see it quite clearly. There's actually where there is a couple of rows of trees, and there's actually a track, okay? And the track was relatively effective in actually stopping the boulders. And if I'm actually going further around, I just wanted to mention this one. 
in um, this slide over here. If you actually look at Morgan's Valley, there's a current track and the current um, rockfall fence actually in here. And you can see where the um, track actually has stopped a large number of boulders. Similarly, so, um, there's a shelter belt over here which did some, uh, also stop some boulders. The point is that if you look at the distribution over here, there are boulders which simply smacked clean through the shelter belt. Okay? How effective is forestry? Forestry generally is very effective, but it's being considered internationally as a third tree measure only. So we have primary measures, which is actually bolting them in slope so they don't start rolling in the first place. Secondary measures or secondary protection measures is actually the fences and bunts or benches. And the tertiary measures is passive measures such as reforestation. Problem with reforestation is that you have to have a, a relatively densely planted uh, forest. It has to be well managed and generally it takes about 15, 20 years before it grows to a decent size. Okay? But generally, stuff does work and it does supplement protective works. Okay? Now, if you're looking over here, and actually do an overlay the um, high stone model over here, the one thing becomes very quickly very apparent. Whereas the modeling on this area matches very well where the rocks actually end up to, if you actually look over here, the rocks reach much, much further than actually what the model uh, predicts. And then this particular area, similarly over here, and that's actually an artifact of the typical geology over here. The boulders are there much bigger. And because they're actually falling from a larger height, they had much, much more energy. So in this particular area, the energies and the bounces are much higher than for the rest of, uh, let's say, bridal path area. Okay? So what I showed the, mo showed the model that even two areas adjacent to each other could be actually quite different. So what might work in one area will not be appropriate to the other area. Okay? And again, if you're looking at um, the zoning decision, then um, there is a combination of um, green, white, and red, and actually, again, relates to how the model predicts where the life safety lines actually run to, okay? And again, the zoning decision over here. Now, probably I'm going to be talking a bit more about protective uh, works uh, before actually heading over back. Now, we did look at protective works very, very closely over the last couple of months. And we sought international advice uh, from people who actually doing that fairly regularly. Now, um, if you look at actually at the protective uh, measures, then the international advice uh, which we have received is that um, rockfall fences and bonds are generally designed for the occasional boulders that actually do fall down the hillside rather than the mass flux. So the term which was actually coined is actually the flux of boulders coming down slope rather than actually the individual boulders. Now, bunts are much, much more effective than fences to deal with uh, flux of boulders. And there are some instances in uh, Europe where uh, bunts are being used generally in combination with a uh, small rockfall fence on the top of it. These are specific engineered structures, but the problem is that the frequency of impact, even for the high ones, does not equate to anything like what we experienced over here. The two examples of rockfall that were seismically triggered in the recorded history is actually at the moment um, Christchurch, and the other case is the Chi Chi earthquake in Taiwan. Um, in Taiwan, the effective, uh, the protective works were installed and several aftershocks completely overhauled them. So we're still looking at them and we're looking actually how to address the risk. Now probably you guys are in the white zone over here, the majority of you. So the question what to do with you next and what we will do till the 17th of August. Now, first of all, we will actually look how individual houses 
progress through time and how the risk diminishes. At the moment, we have the model which actually shows us the areas which are currently one in 5,000. We have the model which shows us we have the one in 1,000, but we don't have the information in between. So we don't know whether the house is one in 4,500, and it's not going to be 1st of January 2016, it might be the 22nd of February 2017. And it might be just slightly more longer, not necessarily to wait, but there might be some temporary protection uh, pro uh, which actually offers our, our time till the target of one in 10,000 is being hit. So at the moment, we don't know whether the property is closer to the one in 1,000 or closer to the one in 5,000. So this is the information we have requested from GNS. The second information, as Roger indicated, we will look at what protective works could be developed and how can it be implemented. The reality is, if you go right now outside and say, right, I'm going to phone one of the companies which are actually out in the moment and going to buy myself a rock catch fence, the first problem is you will need a building consent for it because these are structures that are not just a meter high. They are generally four to six meter high structures and um, you need anchorage, you need some um, you know, specialist equipment to get there, so they're not small either. If you want to do a bunt, then again, it's not just out of the wheelbarrow, but it's a three to four, sometimes six meter high structure that has actually internal reinforcement, and again, triggers the building consent. And Ethan, correct me if I'm wrong, at any given stage. At this point, if you actually ask an engineer to sign it on it, we can't, because the problem is there is neither a New Zealand um, code or a standard to it, and there is no international standard. So with the next couple... Okay, can I just answer then and then come back to that? Okay, so the first thing is, if you try to consent it, the problem is no one can actually consent it, and an engineer would not be able to do a producer statement to say that you can actually build a structure because there is nothing to actually compare it against. Now, crash to the city council at the moment, um, looking at actually what could be done what other international experience could we actually utilize to actually see for protective structures, whether temporary or permanent. So that's going to happen over the next couple of weeks. Now, coming back to the uh, works that were actually installed on the hills, which you actually consider right now, what you first need to understand is that um, a lot of the material that was um, installed actually upslope was installed there for temporary protection only. It was never intended to actually be there for the long haul. Either it was installed to protect a vital lifeline structure. So if you go around here past Peacock's Gallop and just past the container is what looks like a garden shed. It's actually the main water pump supply station, and the rock mesh fences at the back is actually in there, right? The majority of the rockfall protection works installed were actually done to such a degree to stabilize the rock face so the engineers could actually access it safely. They were not installed, and they are not actually designed to be there for long term. There are some areas which actually have been um, remediated more permanently. As far as I understand, and I, I will clarify this as far as I understand, that was captured in the grant through thing exercise. I think with these ones, I conclude the presentation at my point. I'm gonna be available afterwards for Q&A, and then um, afterwards, afterwards, I'm gonna be also available, you can approach me one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Can I hand over back to you? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jan. So, no, thank you for that, but we will come back through the Q&A, and as Rian said, there's going to be more space afterwards, and this is certainly not going to be the last conversation we'll be having around uh, these issues for a lot of people. So, into the uh, section 124, the dreaded section 124 notices, and uh, overall, people who have been rezoned from white to green, uh, those 124 notices uh, will be removed. That's now overtaken by the green zone. And there are, I should point out, a couple of 
uh, reasons why the 124s are applied. It's not always because of those external uh, geotechnical issues. It can also be because of structural issues in a building itself. So I'm really referring to the ones that are driven by the geotechnical issues. So green, people have gone green, they are now removed. If you've had one on your house, uh, we had trouble getting through the phones on Friday to contact everybody in that situation, but by now you either have or will be getting very soon a written statement to explain to you those details. If you've been rezoned from white to uh, red, the 124 notices at the moment stay uh, in place. Those areas uh, will need to be reassessed. On average, all of the 124s are reassessed about once every six weeks. And it may be that in some of those red zones, as a result of the new geotechnical information that drove these decisions, there could be, in addition to being in a red zone, actually a uh, 124 placed on it as well. Uh, remaining white, we've got, I think, about 114 uh, 124 notices uh, out there. So uh, at this stage, uh, there should be nobody living in any, any buildings that have got a 124 on them. And uh, it's not a pleasant duty, but it is a duty that Council has to perform. And uh, if you have a 124 notice, or it's going to be implied, you are expected to... Uh, leave that house immediately. And uh, we uh, have the unpleasant job of also then having to enforce those notices. So uh, there will be some more reassessments done. Some will come off. In some areas, the one, two falls will go on. But there is a process that you can follow to object to a section 124. In the first instance, you contact the Department of Building and Housing. And they'll assess the work that uh, council has done and determine whether that was uh, appropriate or whether, in fact, council has got it wrong. If you still don't like uh, that outcome, then you can actually appeal it to a court. And at the end of the day, a judge will uh, make a decision around that. So although we uh, give it our best intent to ensure that they don't get put on places where they shouldn't be, you do have rights to uh, appeal through that process. Okay, now one of the outcomes of the work that is being done here, it is uh, very likely that the uh, areas where you can and cannot build in the uh, Port Hills area that are currently in the district plan will have to be changed. So at the end of the day, uh, and I guess at the end of the process that we're in, when these lines have been drawn finally, they will also amend the city plan. So if a property is determined to be in too great a danger to actually be lived in again, uh, that will actually be taken out of the city plan as residential land. And we'll have to review a, a whole lot of things as a result of that in terms of land use over the Port Hills area. We've got also some landslip areas uh, in the city which will require ongoing monitoring. I think they're all currently green, but it is a process of that having to be continuously re reviewed, and that's probably as much as anything connected into weather conditions. So it's not an unusual situation. There are many places in New Zealand where people are living in areas where there is constant monitoring of uh, the landslip that uh, might be in that area. And finally, the uh, issue that uh, has been in the headlines in the last 24 hours is around cost. Uh, from uh, your point of view, uh, the uh, costs are coming from one of, or both of two sources, central government and local government. And the issue here is why is local government part of the financial solution? Why isn't government just picking up all of the costs uh, as they are on the flat land, on the uh, red zones in the city? And the difference here is the geotechnical hazards exist off of the property. So EQC, which was brought in after the uh, 1931 Napier-Hastings earthquake, uh, was a kind of a government-based structure to ensure that there was a type of insurance available for your land. But if the issue isn't on your land, it's somewhere else, then that's not an EQC issue. 
it's actually part of the responsibilities of your local council under the Resource Management Act. So we haven't made a uh, final decision with government yet on where that split will be, whether it'll be a 50-50 split or something of a different nature. That's an ongoing discussion. Uh, it would have been good to have had that resolved before this point, but the reality was the information was available to give most people, and unfortunately you're on that small, smaller group that uh, was not able to be given clarity at this time, and hopefully that'll all be resolved in the weeks ahead as that detailed work is finished. So uh, we thought it was more important to get that decision out as quickly as possible because so many people have been waiting for so long. So I'll hand back to Roger now. He's going to take us through some of the support uh, systems that are available uh, for you out there. So the, 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 these are available both in a face-to-face -face sense but also um, over the telephone as well. Um, these are very difficult times. We've made life more difficult for people not giving them a decision last Friday as well. As the poster over there says, people, you know, people in the Voca Valley, Voca Valley have been out for 496 days. Um, so there's a face-to-face -face, uh, place you can go, which is an earthquake support centre, which is at the Avondale um, Golf Club on Wainoni Road. Um, and that's got um, us there, and that's in Sarah. It's got the insurance industry there, various other professionals can give you help. Um, there's also a bunch of outreach services as well, but I'll just go through there. First of all, CTAS, and see some, Sarah, some CTAS people here tonight. So CTAS people are here to help you with temporary accommodation stuff. Um, they're also there to make sure you get any government entitlements. So there is this government entitlement where they pay out once your insurance money is run out for um, uh, accommodation support, and that is not means tested at all. Um, but that is, that's a free service, and it looks to try and give people into accommodation. The earthquake support coordinators, the earthquake support coordinators here as well. So earthquake support coordinators are not councillors as such, but they're people, there's about 60 of them, and their role is to work with um, families and individuals who, need, who don't know where to go to get help or assistance through this process. So they're not, as they're not, while they're not councillors, they're there to try and direct you and they know what support is available and where to go off and get things done. So that's a free and confidential um, service and they're available on the phone, you can register online, but they'll be also happy to come out and see you as well. But also here tonight is, um, are some councillors from the, from, the uh, from the Canterbury District Health Board, they are in the orange vests, and they are here tonight because we know people are in a lot of stress, so they're here if you do want to have a conversation tonight or for some ongoing um, support as well. Um, so this is also an online, um, a, 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 the Canterbury support line, there's an 0800 number, but it has links to other organisations and also links to these earthquake support coordinators. So there's various ways of getting in touch with earthquake support coordinators, both through that 0800 number, but just the normal 0800 ring zero, which is the line which you can generally get through to us on. The, the Kaitahu support line is a service um, funded by Te Puna Kōkiri, um, but it's not just for Māori, it's for the wider community. Um, and they'll work with your whānau um, and work through any issues you've got as well. So that's another, that's another support service available as well. So just, just to sum up, I mean, before I do sum up, for people who are read tonight, um, we have people at the back who can talk to you about the red zone process in terms of offers and those sort of things. We're not going to talk about it here now because um, there's not very many of you. Um, but there are people in the back of the room who will give us a wave, who can tell you a bit about that. Michelle Mitchell and the rest of her team are out the back there. They'll be happy to talk to you about that. But look, the overriding thing here is around safety. Um, I know there's some cynicism out there that you know, the government wants to throw you out of your homes. Well, the government's incentives to throw you out of your homes are just very weak because... You know, if we do throw you out of your home, we're going to have to pay out a lot of money. So the government's incentives here aren't, aren't particularly strong to get people out of their houses. We know it's not good for recovery to get people out of their houses. We want people to get back into their houses as quickly as possible. And I really regret the fact that it's taking us very, very, so very, very long to get, you, to get your decisions. Um, it is a thorough process. Um, some people would say it was too thorough. 
but it's life for us to get safety we're dealing with and people also want us to make sure we have actually run a process which, which reflects that. Um, I live on the Port Hills, um, as you do. I love the Port Hills. I love to run and bike up there, so I do have the similar, you know, I can't imagine living on the flat in Christchurch, and I'm sure a lot of you guys couldn't imagine living on the, on the flat either. Um, and that's really all we've got there. So move on to the questions. And Phil had a question just about transparency. Um, well, I, guess, I guess part of the thing is we're having Jan here tonight to talk. Um, Jan is available at the end of the meeting with um, both Don and Jamie, who are both geotech engineers. Um, the reason why we haven't tended to want to put these, all the details of these reports out before the zoning decisions have been made is in the past when we've done that, or bits of them have been picked up, they get published in the press, you'll find some armchair expert who'll pick it up and go, look, I've looked at that report, don't you know that, that report, and I, my estimation is that those 158 white properties, 120 of them are going to go red. I'm very sure of it. I've looked at the report, and that just causes further stress in the community. So not everyone agrees that that would happen or that would be a stressful thing, but that's why the decision's been taken not to release that information until the zoning decisions have been made, Phil.